morning. I have to admit that I've always had a little bit of a problem with that hymn, but as we were singing it this morning, I thought of something that, that uh, made it more special to me. Um, it takes one to know one. It takes one to know one. It really does. You know, that hymn's all about praying for sinners, uh, but it takes a sinner to know a sinner. And uh, so in that regard, it's, uh, it's a good hymn. Uh, let's, uh, let's ask the Lord's blessings on our time together. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that once again you've been pleased to bring us each from our homes and come to thy house. Lord, that you've promised to meet here with us. We thank you for your word. We pray that you would open it and break the bread of life and reveal to us the, the glorious person of thy dear son. Lord, we pray that you would open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing of grace on our hearts. And let us leave this place today, Lord, having our hope and I rest in thy dear son, who has himself accomplished the salvation of thy people. Lord, open our hearts. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. For truly, Lord, as we've just sung together, that all that we do here will be in vain unless the Holy Spirit comes down. And so, Lord, we pray that our worship will not be vain worship, but that it will be blessed and inspired worship. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Will you open your Bibles with me to Acts chapter 19? Acts chapter 19. <clears throat> I've titled, titled this message, The Real Problem with unbelief, what is at the root of man's unbelief. We're going to see that in uh, the testimony of Demetrius and the other craftsmen that were in Ephesus selling their wares and having their, their lives and their profits and their investments threatened by the gospel. And uh, we see in that what really is the root cause of unbelief. I've experienced enough excuses in my own life over the years, and I've heard enough from others to know that the reason that we often present for our problem is not really the root cause of the problem. The heart, the scripture says, is deceitful and desperately wicked and that we have a hard time knowing our own hearts. Scripture also says that we are by nature liars. And uh, we will go on lying to ourselves and deceiving ourselves and deceiving others unless the Lord is pleased to reveal the real root cause of our, of our unbelief. And, uh, and so my hope this morning is that we will learn from, from God's word what the, uh, what the real problem is. Someone says, well, my problem is physical. My problem is I've got some very serious health issues. Or someone else might think, well, my problem is financial or my problem is emotional, or my problem is relational. I've got a problem with a person in my life. Is that really the problem? Or is there another problem that's below that? Um, what is the real reason for unbelief? The scripture says that the sin that doth so easily beset us is the sin of unbelief. It is the root cause of all of our sin. Really, 
what we present as a problem in relationship to finances or relationships or health issues. What causes those things to be a problem is our unbelief. Isn't that true? If, uh, if we believed God, uh, <laughs> we would believe what he said to the apostle Paul when Paul thought his problem was a thorn in the flesh, the Lord said, no, <laughs> my grace is sufficient for thee. And as the Lord made his grace sufficient to the apostle Paul for that thorn, Paul said, I will therefore glory in my infirmities. For when I am weak, then I am strong, for his strength is made perfect in my weakness. The problem is not the thorn that we have in our flesh. The problem is the unbelief that we have in our hearts. <clears throat> the problem is sin. It really is. That's the, that's the root cause of all our problems, sin and unbelief. Oh, I pray the Lord will cause us to believe that and that we will stop deceiving ourselves over what we think the problem is when really the problem is our inability to trust God as we ought. It's sin problem, isn't it? That's why we have to preach Christ because we will not see ourselves for what we are. We will not see ourselves as sinners until we see the Lord Jesus Christ for who he is. The holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners and higher than the heavens, son of God. And when we see him, when God's pleased to give us a glimpse of his holiness and a glimpse of his glory, well, our response will be the same response as it's always been for everyone that's ever seen the Lord. What did Isaiah say? I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Woe is me. <laughs> Woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. <laughs> now here's the problem. The problem's in my heart. The problem is my sin. <clears throat> when uh, Daniel saw the Lord, Daniel said, my comeliness is turned into corruption. That which I thought was my strength, that's what the word comeliness means, is now turned into weakness. And I see that I'm dependent completely upon him. When Peter saw the Lord after the resurrection, he fell at his feet and said, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Oh, he thought he had a lot of other problems, but when he saw the Lord, when he saw the Lord, when, when Job heard the gospel preached from Elihu, and then the Lord spoke to Job's heart, what's the first words out of Job's mouth? Behold, <laughs> behold, I see something I've never seen before. Truly, I am vile. There's my problem. <laughs> There's my problem. You know, the blame game goes all the way back to the garden, doesn't it? And if we, if the Lord doesn't, doesn't make us to be sinners, Cause us to see that this is the root cause of all of our problems. We'll go about thinking that the problems are the secondary issues. Those issues that we spend so much time and energy on. If God would enable us to believe him and trust him. Now what does it mean to be made a sinner? Does it, does it mean that, uh, that we feel the full and true shame of our sin? That we spend sufficient time as the old Puritans used to do, kneeling at the mourner's bench, shedding buckets of tears until, we, until we've come to some place of contrition and repentance? Is that, is that what it means to see ourselves as a sinner? Only the Lord Jesus Christ ever felt the full weight of sin. Only he sorrowed for sin sufficiently in a way that God is pleased with. You and I are not capable of that. If the Lord shows us himself, we will conclude that we are sinners. We are nothing but sin 
Lord, it is, the, it is really the root cause of all my problems. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he, when he sweat drops of blood in the Garden of Gethsemane, when the weight of sin began to be put on him, that's the tears that God's looking for, those droplets of sweat that fell from his body. When he hung on Calvary's cross and cried, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That was the cry of repentance and sorrow for sin that God was pleased with. You see, our repentance doesn't bring forgiveness. But to see him for who he is and to, and to believe on him will bring repentance. <laughs> it's, it, it, repentance doesn't bring forgiveness. Forgiveness brings repentance. You see that? <laughs> what a difference. <clears throat> this principle applies to so many area, every area of life, family, friends, work, whatever. Uh, but I want to speak to it as it relates to this church. And, um, and I've heard people say, um, you know, I don't come to church because there's too many hypocrites there. You won't hear a sinner say that. You will not hear a sinner say that because every sinner believes themselves to be the biggest hypocrite in the church. You just, you can't even imagine how hypocritical I feel standing up here preaching the gospel to you. <laughs> I really believe that I'm the biggest hypocrite here. Or someone will say, I don't come to church because the preacher is an antinomian. <laughs> he's, uh, what they mean by that, he's not affirming me in the works that I'm doing uh, because that's my affirmation. That's the hope of my salvation. Or they'll flip the other side and say, well, the preacher's, um, he, he's legalistic. If I ever suggest anything to do with responsibility or duty of the believer, some are offended. Some will say, well, that's too legalistic. No. You know, my experience over the years is that whenever I mention something from the pulpit in terms of duty or responsibility, that the most tender-hearted sinners are the ones offended most. They're wounded, not offended at me, but they're wounded in thinking that I was speaking to them <laughs> when really I probably had somebody else in mind who wasn't even here. But it's the most tender hearted child of God that takes it personal and thinks, well, well, he must know something about my life that, you know, that you see, the, you see how it is. You can't offend a child of God. You can't offend a sinner with telling them or rebuking them or exhorting them about their responsibilities because they know that they're not, they're not, as, they're not fulfilling their duty as they ought. <laughs> but you see, what I'm saying is that the things that I hear from people as to terms of why they get offended or why they don't come to church, that's really not the cause. The cause is that they've not seen themselves as a sinner. <laughs> Someone asked me sometime, they said, well, you know, so-and-so hadn't been here in a long time. Do you think they're coming back? I said, well, I don't know. But I know one thing for sure. If they don't, it's going to be my fault. <laughs> you know, it's just the way it goes. They're going to point their finger at me or somebody else and say, well, you know, it's their fault that we're not coming. No, they, they don't come because they're not needy. They don't have a sin problem. They don't need a savior. They don't need to sit under the gospel. This is the, this is the real cause of unbelief. Is that men don't see themselves as sinners. Someone will say, well, you know, I've been offended by someone in the church. Sinners are too grieved 
over the offense that they'd been towards someone else to be worried about the offense of someone else towards them. So when a person says, well, I've been offended by someone in the church, that's not the problem. The problem is that they don't see themselves as a sinner. Otherwise, they'd be more grieved over their own offenses than they would over someone else's. You see that? You see, men present one thing as the problem when really the problem is that they don't believe themselves to be a sinner because they've not seen themselves before Christ. You know, man by nature is going to compare himself to himself and he's going to conclude that he's getting better. <laughs> or he's going to compare himself to others and he's going to conclude that, you know, well, at least I'm above average. But when God makes you to be a sinner, you say with the Apostle Paul, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. <laughs> that was at the end of his life he said that. That was a man that had grown in grace and the knowledge of Christ and was used of God to write most of the New Testament and said, <laughs> I'm the chief of sinners. You see, there's the problem, isn't it? All these other things are just smoke screens. They're just, they're lies. They're not true. Someone says, well, I don't feel welcome. That's why I don't come. That's not the problem. Sinners aren't here to feel welcomed by men. They're here to meet the welcoming Savior with his arms open to embrace them and love them and forgive them and give them their grace. That's what sinners are here for. If you're here for any other reason, you're going to find a reason to leave. Someone's going to offend you. I'm probably going to be me. Someone says, well, you know, I've just got too many issues going on in my life, too many things to tend to. That's not the problem. <laughs> no, no, if they, if you're overwhelmed with the circumstances of your life, this is the one place you need to be, isn't it? The one place sinners are when they realize I've got, I've got too much. I, Lord, I can't bear this burden. I've got to have Christ. Lord, I'm full of sin and weak and needy. You see what I'm saying? I'm just telling you from my personal example uh, experience um, what men will say when really the problem is that they have not seen themselves as sinners. They're protecting their investment. It is not man's sin that keeps him from Christ. It is his righteousness. Men who do not believe themselves to be sinners are holding on to a righteousness that they're trusting in for the hope of their salvation. John chapter three, verse 20, light has come into the world, but men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. They loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Men won't come to Christ because they don't want their deeds to be exposed for what they are. Sinners do. Sinners, sinners love to be told that they're sinful. It's the reminder of their sinfulness. You see, there's a Pharisee within each of us. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm a lot more concerned about the Pharisee in here than I am the one out there. And there's a Pharisee within each of us that has to be, that has to be put to death. And, and there's, a, there's a, a clinging to our works of righteousness that has to be exposed and reproved. And so we come to the light in order that our, that our sin might be reproved and exposed for what it is. Even those who won't come to Christ because they are enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. If they ever saw Christ 
and saw themselves as a sinner. And if their righteousness, the righteousness that even they are holding to, was made filthy rags, they'd come. They'd come. We talk about total depravity and unconditional election and limited atonement and irresistible grace and perseverance of the saints of God. You know the acronym, TULIP. Those are dominoes that all fall together when the first one is pushed over. When God makes you to be a sinner, when you see yourself having fallen in Christ, you won't have any problems with unconditional election. You won't have any problems with particular redemption or limited atonement or irresistible grace or perseverance of the saints. You see, that's really the root problem, isn't it? This is the, men are presenting one thing as the issue when really the issue is something else. Now to our text, quickly. <clears throat> Acts chapter 19, verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Deanna, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen. This man was making a profit off of religion. The temple of Diana was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was a huge edifice to the worship of the sun goddess and the goddess of light in the city of Ephesus. The remains of that, of that are there today in Ephesus. And, um, and, the, and the people at Ephesus were proud of their goddess. The whole world came to Ephesus to worship Diana. And so this man was making a great profit off of this pagan goddess. Religion can be very profitable and there are many people involved in it for financial gain, but there are more people involved in it to protect the investment of their own righteousness. The Lord said, it is more difficult for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven than it is. Uh, how, it's more difficult for, easier for a camel <laughs> to go through the eye of a needle than it is for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And the disciples were amazed. They said, Lord, who then can be saved? And what did the Lord say? He's not talking about just financial riches, although those things can be a means by which we don't trust God as we ought because we can pay our way out of everything. But more so than that, he's talking about the riches of one's righteousness, the investment of righteousness that they're looking to and trusting in for the hope of their salvation. And the disciples said, who then Lord can be saved? And the Lord said, with man, it's impossible. He'll never turn from his righteousness. He'll never look to Christ, but with God, all things are possible. <laughs> you see, all men are rich in their own righteousness. And until the Lord is pleased to make you to see that all your righteousness are as filthy rags, you'll not come to Christ. You'll not come. Here's the real problem. So this Demetrius had his investment in this goddess Diana and in the religion of the day. And nothing's changed. Oh, most men in our culture and in our associations today call Diana Jesus. And they say that he's the God of life and the God of the sun, but they don't believe themselves to be sinners and they've not seen him as God. And they've not, they, you listen to what they say about him, they just, it just, it's just not true. Verse 25. Whom he called together with the workmen <laughs> of like occupation. <laughs> 
So he gets together all of these religious uh, associates of his who are making a profit off of Diana. And he says to them, sirs, you know that by this craft, we have our wealth. <laughs> by what we're doing with our hands, by the fashioning of these false gods and these false hopes and these lies of, of false righteousness, self-righteousness. This is how we make our living. This is our craft. Verse 26, moreover, you see and hear that not only alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul hath persuaded and turned many people saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. Now, that's what we're saying. <laughs> we're saying that when you put your hand to your salvation, you've, you've defiled it. That's the, that's the picture of Uzzah touching the ark. And he defied, God killed him because he put his hand, his dirty hand to the ark. His sinful hand to the ark. That's why the Lord said when you make an altar, don't, don't put a tool to the stone. When the Old Testament believers gathered together stones in order to make a burnt sacrifice, the Lord forbid them to put their hands to it. Don't try to fashion the stone and make it look pretty and stack it up nice. Just pile up those stones. Because as soon as you put your hand to it, you've defiled it. And so Demetrius is saying this craft that we have is the, is the craftiness of our own works. <laughs> it's the... It's the hope that we have in what we're fashioning with our hands. And this guy's coming along and saying that they be no gods which are made with the hands of men. And that's the root of the gospel, isn't it? Verse 27, so that not only this our craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also that the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised and her magnificence should be destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. Now there's the smoke screen. There's what they're going to, there's the argument that they're going to use to incite a riot. And you read the rest of this chapter, a riot breaks out. All the people come to the theater in Ephesus and they all cry, great is the Diana, the, the goddess of, of Ephesus. For two hours, they chanted that. All they heard was that this man is, is defiling our goddess. But what was the real problem? What was the root cause of their objections? It was the loss of their wealth. That was the problem. They were pretending to defend the honor of Diana, but the truth is they didn't care about Diana. Diana was just a means to their own selfish end. <laughs> They were, they were more concerned about their wealth than they were about the honor of Diana. And so when men say about the gospel, I don't believe it because it dishonors God in some way. That's not it. I don't believe it because I've invested too much of my life and too much of my righteousness in this false gospel. And if I believe what you're preaching, I've got to jettison all of that. I've got to lose it all. I lose my wealth. I lose my pr profession. You see, you see, here's the problem. Here's the issue going on here. Demetrius tells his fellow workers what the real problem is, but then he tells the crowd what he wants them to believe so that he can get them on his side to, uh, to support is getting Paul out of town, <laughs> which happens at the very end of this chapter. Nothing's changed, has it? Nothing's changed. There's still the same issue. Men will say, well, this is the problem. Well, that's the problem. No, the real problem is that this gospel will strip you of all your wealth. 
your spiritual wealth and your material wealth. It'll put, it'll, it'll put you in a place where everything you've got belongs to God. And men will not have that. They'll not have it. I will not have this man to reign over me. And the real problem is that they don't see themselves as sinners. That's the issue. So when somebody starts giving you all these reasons why they're doing this or that or why they're not coming to church, don't believe them. That's just a smokescreen. That's a diversion. The real problem is that if I believe that, I'm going to lose everything. I'm going to lose everything. But it worked. Demetrius and the other men that were involved in his craft, who got their wealth from their works and from where their hands, <laughs> their lies to the masses worked. Look what, look what happens. And when they, verse 28, and when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out saying, great is Diana of Ephesus, of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion and having caught Gaius and Aristarchus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions to travel, they rushed with one accord into the theater. And when people would have entered in unto the, and when Paul would have entered into the, unto the people, the disciples suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theater. Paul wanted to go into the, th to the theater and declare unto them the gospel. Tell them what the real issue was. But these men knew that he'd, be, he'd been murdered in that theater. I shared with our folks Wednesday night. We were looking at verses before this. and um, Several years ago, uh, Trish and I were on a cruise. And we went to Ephesus, uh, which is in Turkey. And, and the ruins are all there. And I'm, I had talked to a man on the ship who was from Lexington, Kentucky, and had heard Todd preach on TV in Lexington. And we're in, we're in Turkey. <laughs> and uh, so we're touring the old ruins and I'm standing in the very theater that, that's being described here. It's all there. And uh, this guy comes up to me and he says, now what is it that you all believe? And I told him and he started shaking his head. If he had had a crowd of people, they would have done exactly. What I'm trying to say to you is that nothing has changed. You can go back to the same spot or you can go right to where you are with your friends and family members. Nothing's changed. Great is my God. Are you saying that my God is no God? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Either your God's no God or my God's no God. They can't both be God. So there's great confusion. And when, uh, look at verse 32. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused. And the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. The majority of the people didn't even know why they were there. They just knew they were there to defend the honor of Diana. No, they weren't defending the honor of Diana. They were, they were defending the investment of Demetrius and his friends who were making profit off of the religion of Diana. And that's what men are defending today when they want to debate and argue the gospel. They are defending their investment, their righteousness toward their false God and their religion there's the real problem. They've not been made sinners. When uh, the Lord raised Lazarus from the dead um, in John chapter 11, and there were men there that watched this miracle. This man had been dead four days. They came out of the grave. 
they unwrapped his mummy clothing and, you know, took the grave clothes off of him. And I mean, you can imagine the, the amazement of that event. And some believed, but some didn't. Even though they saw it with their own eyes, they didn't believe. They ran back into Jerusalem and they told the Jewish leaders and the Sanhedrin got together. And here's what the high priest said. He said, what are we going to do? This man performs many miracles. And if we allow him to continue, the Romans will come and they will take away both our place and our nation. There's the problem. They're going to take away the power and the influence that we have over the people. They're going to rob us of our wealth if we allow this man to come. And so they trumped up charges against him and they said, well, he's going to destroy the temple or he's, he's, he's uh, blaspheming or he's an he's a insurrectionist. And they made all these false charges against him. What was the real problem? Losing power over the people. Losing their nation, losing their investment, losing their righteousness. This was the real problem. What a blessing it is when God the Holy Spirit opens the eyes of our understanding and causes us to see what the real problem is. The real problem is that I'm a sinner. The real problem with all the difficulties and things in my life that I want to point to as my problem aren't really the problem. It's my unbelief. <laughs> it's my unbelief. I want to close briefly with a story. It's a personal story, not just to me, but to several of you that are here. And it's a 25 year old story. And the reason I want to tell you this story is because it relates to this very point. Someone asked me yesterday if um, they asked me permission to go visit the old church that I used to pastor because they wanted to find out why I left. And I said, well, you don't need my permission to do that. Go. <laughs> but I'll tell you why I left. And I told him and. And uh, some of you know this story very well. Todd Nybert came down from Kentucky, preached the gospel. God gave some of us ears to hear. And I started to try to preach Christ. And there were men in that church that hated what they were hearing. And, uh, and they hated me as a result of that. And um, 11 weeks after Todd came down, um, it was clear that this wasn't going to work. Someone asked me on the Sunday before I resigned on Monday if I was going to resign because they knew there was turmoil in the church. And I said, no. This was the day before. I said, no, I'm not going to resign. I was here when they got here, and I'll be here when they leave. I'm going to keep preaching the gospel. Well, Monday morning, I got a letter from a lawyer in the church telling me that he had a petition and demanding that I come before the Sanhedrin to answer their questions. And the Lord revealed to me, you all know this story, some of you do. We had purchased a very valuable piece of property and paid cash for it. And after we bought that property, the Orlando Magic built their training center right across the street from it. And the value of that property skyrocketed. And we had men in that church that had made investments into that property. And they, I, I, because I was confused. Well, you know, why don't you, there's plenty of places for you to go. Just leave if you don't like what I'm preaching. They wouldn't leave. They would not leave. And on that Monday morning, it became clear to me that they're not going to leave. Because they're holding on to that investment that they have in that property. Yes, they hate the gospel. But it's the investment they have in the property that's not going to allow them to walk away. And I wrote up my resignation on Monday morning, sent it to everybody in the church. And uh, I'm so thankful that on that Sunday before, I didn't know I was going to resign because I would have gone out in a 
flame of glory. I mean, <laughs> I would have given them a piece of my mind and I didn't. I just preached the gospel on that Sunday and the next morning I resigned. But it was over the property. It was over that piece of property. It was worth millions. And, uh, and they weren't going to leave it. They had too much invested in their religion. That was the real problem. And so it is with men who will not believe the gospel. I've got too much invested in my goddess of Diana. And I'm not going to walk away from that. And God makes you to be a sinner. You'll be stripped naked before God and you'll have nothing but Christ. <laughs> nothing but Christ. He'll be all your righteousness. He'll be your life. He'll be your salvation. You won't be holding on to anything. Amen? All right, let's take a break.